Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Baba Kama Daf Yud Aleph. Today's, this week's learning is sponsored by Jason and Danielle Friedman in honor of Oliver Friedman's upcoming bar mitzvah, Azal Tov. Okay, we're going to get started with the end of yesterday's daf, and I did a chart on today's study guide to review the end of yesterday's daf that we kind of rushed through at the end. I just want to talk about the main concept of it. I'm not going to go through the details again, but the main concept that we started with at the, toward the bottom of Yud Amubet is that when the mazik pays the nizak, okay, let's use an example of Ruth damaged Naomi's property. When Ruth pays, okay, whether it's, again, her animal, her vessels, whatever it might be, when Ruth pays Naomi the amount, she pays the amount it was worth from the beginning and deducts the value of what it's worth now. So if whatever's left of the item is still worth something, whether it's the avail of a dead animal, which, well, that's the main example they're bringing, she only pays the difference. So yesterday we brought an example, it was worth 300, and now it's only worth 100, but it is still worth 100, so Ruth only has to pay $200. Okay, now, this is what we call, and the main thing is Naomi gets left with the dead animal, which she really has nothing to do with, so she's gonna have to sell it, but the onus is on her to sell it. So then we said, we learned it from three different verses, which all related to three different cases, and then we tried to say, why couldn't we learn one from the other? Why do we need all three? Because theoretically, you would have thought that maybe, right, the, the less, res- the more the mazik is responsible, the more we would have thought that maybe the mazik has to sell the novella and deal with that. And actually, maybe Ruth would need to reimburse Naomi the full amount. The more we put the responsibility on Ruth and for what she did wrong, let's say Makebe Ma, for example, is she did it with her own hand. She attacked you know, she personally caused damage to Naomi's animal. Maybe you would think then, right, the onus would be on her. And that's why each case, right, was saying, even though for whatever reason, each time you might think the onus was more on Ruth, no, in the end, the halacha is by all three cases, Naomi's going to be left with the nevema. Now the Gemara is going to say, okay, we're starting from five lines from the bottom of the daf, at least in my Gemara. I'm going Rav Kahana the Rav. Rav Khan is saying to Rav, well, now we're just taking the Pasuk about the boar. Hamei yellow, which again means Hamei yellow. That means Naomi, the one who got, whose shore was damaged, she gets left with the shore. Okay, so in, in the, this case, it was a boar case, that Pasuk, right? So Kesef Yashiv the Ba'alav. So Ruth has to pay Naomi because Ruth dug a pit and Naomi's animal fell in. Ruth has to pay Naomi the damages. But then it says Hamei yellow, but Naomi keeps the animal, which was the whole halacha that we just learned. Well, now they're going to say the following. This assumes that because it says Hamei Yelo, Naomi gets it. Were it not for that, you would have assumed that Ruth has to pay the full value of the animal, 300, which seems reasonable, right? If I had asked you, again, we talked about this yesterday, you would have said, of course, Ruth, Ruth has to pay the full value of the animal. We didn't think, oh, you're going to leave Ruth, Naomi with that dead animal and she'll have to deal with it. Well, Elatana, the cut of Rahman Hamei Yelo, Halaf Hafi, Hava Min, and Nevela de Mazikavia, they're not questioning that. Would you really have thought that? If, if we didn't have this pasuk, they're now saying, you really, without that, we actually would have thought that the nevela goes to the mazik. Would you really have thought that? Would you really have thought that Ruth ends up with the dead animal and Ruth has to compensate Naomi for the full amount? Really? Well, now we're going to prove that there's no way you would have thought that. It's obvious that Naomi gets left with the dead animal and Ruth just pays the difference. Why? Well, this is going to go back to a studio we already saw. If you remember, what did we say? Kesef Yashiv Lebalav, the beginning part of that Pesach taught you. If Ruth wanted to, she could pay Naomi just in bran, right? Which means if she had three treif animals, treif animals, meaning three dead animals, okay? Or I will use the word treif here, but let's assume, okay? Ruth had three dead carcasses, animal carcasses in her house, and each one was worth a hundred. She could definitely pay in dead carcasses. So if that's the case, since she could pay in Sabine, she can pay in animal carcasses, which means that Ruth theoretically, not theoretically, if Naomi is left with the dead animal, we're going to leave Naomi with that dead animal, and Ruth is only going to have to pay her $200 and not three full hundred dollars and keep the dead animal. Because if Ruth could pay her with the dead animal, obviously she could leave the dead animal in Naomi's hands and only pay her the difference. So therefore... Why is there even a drasha of a hameti yellow? What is it to teach you, if not the halacha that we just said, which there's no reason to teach you that. So they're going to have to modify a little. And they're going to tell you, fine. So it's definitely obvious. You don't need the pasuk to tell you that Naomi gets left with her dead animal. And it's even though it wasn't her fault the damage happened, she's left with the dead animal. If she wants the value of the money, she's got to go sell it in the show. But what's it coming to teach you, hameti yellow, that Naomi keeps the dead animal? 
What it's to tell you is, okay, let's go back to our example. We've damaged an animal that originally was worth 300. Now it's worth, it's dead, it's 100. Ruth has to pay 200. But what if by the time Ruth and Naomi get to court, as we all know, that could take a while, the carcass is now only worth 80. It goes down in value. Does Ruth have to pay 220 or does she only pay 200? Like the, from the time of the, of the accident or right, the, whatever it was. So the answer is the pot novella, the depreciation of the novella is hamei'ielo. That means um, Naomi, I'm the damaged one. The mei'ielo, the depreciation is on her, meaning it goes by the value at the time of the death of the animal. So if the animal excuse me, was 100 at the time of the death, then that's the amount Ruth is going to have to pay. She's not going to have to pay any more than the 200, even if the animal goes down in value by the time they get to court. Okay, that's called pchat nevela. That pchat is depreciation. So that's the depreciation of the nevela is on the nisa. Okay, so again, even though the mazik, we started off in the beginning of the masecha, but the mazik has to pay with the best of their land. Their hand is right there, yadam ala tachtona, as we say. Now, you get the worst because you damage someone's property. In the end, we say, well, it's not so bad because in this area, the, the carcass is valued at the moment of the death of the animal and not at the moment of the, the ruling in the court. Okay, now, now the Gora is going to ask, Lema Pchat Nevela Tanaihi. Is it possible that there's a debate about who the Pchat Nevela is on? Maybe Ruth does have to pay 220 according to one opinion. Let's see. Ditan says in a bright In Tarof Yitaref This is a passage we saw before. Just talking about a Shomer Sachar. Someone who gets paid to watch someone's animal or item, whatever it is, and then some accident happens or something happens, and they, you know, get stolen, whatever it is. Okay, so then it says, so in the, this case, it's some crazy, you know, animal came by and attacked the, the, the animal that they were watching. It says, So now, we darshan this in a particular way before. Now we're going to see two other ways of darshaning it. And what does it mean, And this is really the simple reading of the Pasuk. The Sahar, if you get paid to watch someone's animal, so you're responsible, a high level of responsibility because you were getting paid to do the job. So if you didn't do the job, well, you're responsible. The only thing you're not responsible for is onus. If some crazy thing happened, like, you know, a lion ran out of the zoo and started, you know, and ran around and, and attacked the animal. Totally unexpected. So what does it mean, Yavi'ehu ed? Yavi'ehu shenitrefa ba'onus u patur. Now, Yavi'ehu sounds like you bring the animal as proof. But here, it's not the animal you're going to bring as proof. You have to bring witnesses that this animal was attacked unexpectedly, totally crazy circumstances. And then you'll be patur. Okay? Fine. That has nothing to do with our topic, really. I mean, let's see. Abshaw lomil, yavi aduda libetim. What is aduda? Aduda is the carcass. Now, why are you going to bring the carcass to court? If not, to prove what the value of the animal is. Now, what it means here is, what he's saying is, the mazik, okay, so you're the shomer, you got paid, okay? Ruth was paid to watch Naomi's animal, and something happened to the animal. Ruth, now in this case, we're assuming it's a case where Ruth is responsible, because most cases are, right, it wasn't onus. Let's say this animal came and attacked in a normal kind of way, and Ruth just had to put a gate around the animal, and some other animal came in and attacked it. Well, Ruth should right away bring the animal to the court to assess its value right now, the carcass, because the depreciation is going to be on the Nizak, right, on Naomi. So Ruth better bring that right now. In other words, you should bring it right now because if you bring it right now, we'll have the value of it right now. Okay? And that's the idea here, that Ruth should bring it to the court because she wants to pay the least possible amount. So if she brings it right away, it'll be assessed right now at what it is, and that's then she can deduct the amount even if by the time the court rules, the animal's already depreciated. So the fact that Abishal explains the Pasuk this way and Tanakhama doesn't must mean that they argue over this issue. My love, Akam Vifelge, is this not the root of their machloket? Demar Savar Pachanavela Deniza Kave. Umar Savar Demazi Kave. So Tanakhama thinks it's actually on the Mazik. And that's why she doesn't have to rush to bring it to court because no matter what, it's only once the court rules that we're going to assess the value of the animal. And then they'll assess and figure out what the value of the animal. But, but Ruth doesn't have to bring it right away because it's not going to make a difference if she brings it right away because we're not going to go by that value. And and um, and and Abishau, who says she should bring it right away, is because the depreciation is going to be on on the Nizak on Naomi. Okay, um, what's the logic to saying? Okay, let's talk about the logic, um, the the conceptual idea here. 
It makes a lot of sense to say it's on the Nizak. Why it makes sense to say it's on the Nizak? Because in the end, what is damage? Well, it was worth 300, now it's worth 100. And we go, it doesn't matter when the court rules, it matters what Ruth did. Ruth took an animal that was worth 300 and she made it worth 100. Now, the fact that by the time this whole thing is over, it goes down in value is irrelevant to the whole picture. Okay, so it actually makes a lot more sense. To say it's the mazik, what would be the logic? To say that in the end, if the animal depreciates, Ruth has to take responsibility for that as well. So the logic would be that for laws of responsibility, the Torah made someone who damages, which would be Ruth in our case, as if she's the owner of this object. You damage something, you become the owner of it. This happens, by the way, we're going to talk about it very soon when we get to a thief. You steal something, which is crazy to think, right? The halacha views you as an owner of that item. Now, it seems crazy. What do you mean? Uh, you don't own it just because you decided to be the owner. But in terms of laws of responsibility, yes, you're an owner. What does it mean? Well, what it means is you have to return it at the value at which you stole it. If it goes down in value, that's not your problem. You have to return it. It's as if that moment you stole it, you became the owner. Likewise here, the moment you damaged it, you own that now. So now when the law, when the, when the court rules that you have to return it, you have to return it at the value it was at the time from the beginning. So therefore, if it depreciates in value, that's your tough luck. Okay, so there's something to be said there for saying it's the mazik. In the end, the Gemara is going to reject this and say no, or not, at least not necessarily. We wanted to suggest maybe it's a machlokat Is the depreciation on the mazik or on the nizak? But they say, lo, de kule ama de nizak. It's, no, we don't really know. But they're going to now suggest a different way to understand the machlokat abishaw and the rabbis. But another debate between them. We started with the issue of, does, right, the first issue was, who gets to keep the novella in the end, right? Who, who's left with the dead carcass? And we said it was the nizak. Now we say, but at what price, right? At what price do we evaluate the time of the the time of the death of the animal, or do we evaluate it based on the time of the court's ruling? Now we say, look, to call it Denizak. Perhaps everybody really holds that the depreciation is on the Nizak, okay? Because again, who who made Ruth the owner of this animal? It's true she caused damage, but we go by it the moment she caused the damage. By the way, there's two interesting things in the Rishonim that I saw. One is the Rush says. It goes from the time that the owner became aware of the damage, not necessarily the time the damage happened, but when Naomi found out that her animal died, that's the moment, not, which is interesting to think about. And then Yimuke Yosef says um, that depreci- what does depreciation mean? Depreciation can mean two things. One is the animal now you know, reeks as time goes on and is worth less. Nobody really wants to deal with it. Or I don't know, for some reason, that animal went down in value in itself. Or it could be price fluctuation as well could be just the price of those animals and the, the dead carcasses and the shook went down, that also is going to be counted as depreciation. It's either or. Don't think it's just that this animal went down in value, but if but if the price in general dropped, still it's going to be on the on the on the Nizak. Okay, Naomi's problem. So now they say, what's the mechloket then between Abishawl who says bring it to the court? Now remember who's the subject of that sentence? The Mazik. Ruth should be bringing it to court. Okay, right? If Ruth killed Naomi's animal, Ruth should bring it to court to be evaluated. Well, now what's the focus here? And the fact that Tanakhama doesn't say that, what's the debate? It's who is responsible to actually bring the animal to court? I never thought about it until this point, but you got to bring this animal, this dead ox, let's say it was an ox, pretty big animal, you got to schlep that to court, that's a pain in the neck. Okay, you might have to hire someone to do it. You might have to, you know, use favors from your friends who are strong people and help them, schlep, you know, help you schlep it. Who's supposed to do that? Is it Ruth's responsibility or Naomi's responsibility? So that's the machloka between Abishal and Tanakam. Abishal says, Yaviu, Yaviu, right? Yaviu, Yaviu, Ed. And this, by the way, right? Yaviu, bring the animal as tes- as testimony. Now, what's Yaviu, Ed? Bring the mazik. The one who was watching it and didn't do a good enough job, Ruth, she has to bring this animal to the court. And Tanakamu doesn't say that's the meaning of the Pasuk, says no, it's on Naomi to bring it. So how do we see this? Well, it actually appears in a bright that there's a machloket about this. Now we're only going to see one side, but it's going to start with achir momrim, which means others say. Others say we often say it's Rabbi Meir, but also it means someone disagrees. Minayin <laughs> We're going back to that same pasuk and again making a different drasha. This pasuk says, right, return the money to the owner, if you, right, the owner of the boar. In this case, we're going to say, Ruth dug a pit, Naomi's animal came in and, and died, 
and Ruth has to pay back the money, and then it says, remember, which means that Ruth only has to pay the amount the animal was worth now, from then, and the amount the animal was worth now, the difference. But now they darshan it a little differently to teach you another halacha, which is, Kesef yeshiv lebalav, meaning Ruth has to give money back to Naomi, vehamed. Instead of saying, yellow, this is a classic type drasha where we put the, 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 the comma in a different place. She returns money to the owner and the dead person, the dead animal, okay? And the dead, meaning she has to bring the dead herself to the court. That's what you see. It's Ruth's responsibility to bring the animal. So now we have a great question. I don't know that I the rafa. So we're assuming now it's a debate. Does Ruth have to bring the animal? Or does Naomi have to bring the animal? Now, they're saying, what kind of burden is the Torah teaching you that the burden is on Ruth? Well, okay, this is just classic logic. If the animal, now we're going to take, forget my 200, 300, and all that, 100. We're going to now take the, the amounts they say here. Let's say the, now, an animal, remember, bringing the animal, let's say it was a pit, means getting the animal out of the pit, which is not so easy either, and picking it up, right, out of a pit and taking it out. Now, if we say that the Torah specifically has a unique drasha to teach us that don't think that Naomi has to do it, Ruth has to do it. But you don't need a pasuk to teach you that. Just like we said earlier, you don't need a pasuk to teach you something else, the pachat nevela. Also, you don't need a pasuk to teach you this. Why? It's just simple laws of economics. A bo- uh, an animal, if I sell you on the street and a dead carcass, okay? Now I sell you a carcass that's sitting on the road or I sell you a carcass that's in a pit. What's going to be the price difference, right? Is there going to be a price difference? Of course. If I sell you and I say, listen, I'm going to sell you this dead carcass. And this, what a carcass is dead. Sorry, I keep saying dead carcass. I sell you this carcass, animal carcass. Basically, if I say it's in the bottom of a pit, well, you're going to say, well, then I'm charging, right? I'm, I'm going to pay you less money for that, right? Because I'm not going to, I'm going to have to, I'm, it's going to cost me. This is like when you, when you want to sell your house, you paint it first. Even though theoretically, right, the person who comes in can paint it themselves, but you're going to paint it and then jack up the price more than the price of what you painted the house for, right? That's just the way it works. So basically, of course, it's in Ruth's best interest to take the animal, the carcass, out of the pit because she's going to, in the end, now why? Because if an animal is worth one in a pit, uh, one out of the pit and four in the pit, well, again, what's the issue? She has to pay the difference, right? Um, I'm sorry. If it's worth, did I just say it wrong? I said it wrong. It's worth one in the pit because, right, who's going to buy a, a, a dead animal in a pit, right? They're going to have to spend money. So you're only going to be able to sell it for one. But if you take it out, it's worth four. You know, it's in Ruth's best interest. She's only paying, let's say the animal was worth 10 when it was alive. So if she doesn't take it out of the boar, it's only worth one. So she's going to have to pay nine. In this case, it's dinarim, okay? Nine dinarim or nine zuzim, which are all the same. She's going to have to pay nine zuzim. If she takes it out, she's going to have to pay only six because it'll be 10 minus six is minus uh, four is six. So now, of course, Ruth is going to be the one to take it out of the pit. Obviously, it's going to be worth a lot more if she can take it out of the pit, just like if she paints her house, it'll be, she'll be able to sell it for more. So therefore, since that's the case, you don't need a puzzle to tell us simple laws of economics. It's obviously in her best interest. She's going to do it anyway. She's going to be the one to do the Torah. So therefore, there's no reason to teach you this halacha. So, right, that's what it says, ki tarach b'dinach tarach. The tircha is all for her benefit, okay? Because the price differential, right, it doesn't cost her three zoos to get it out. But again, no one's going to want to buy it in a pit knowing they're going to have to possibly hire people and get it out and all that. So therefore, it's obvious she's going to, the Torah is on her, whether, right, regardless of what the halacha is going to tell you. So they're saying, no, they're telling you that if for whatever reason the, the animal is worth the same in the pit and out of the pit, then the onus is on Ruth, to which they say, is there possibly such a thing that you could buy it for the exact same price? To which they say, they say yeah. some people say it's possible you could buy a beam in the city for the same price you could buy it in the fields, even though you're going to have to slip it from the fields to the city. Sometimes it costs the same, okay? So it could be there's a case where it's the same. In a case where it's the same, still they're telling you it's on Ruth to do. So what we saw here was, number one, the issue that even though you might have thought otherwise, the nevela stays with the person who's damaged. And Ruth only, right, the one who damaged only pays the differential. 
and it's on them to, to return it. We kind of said, well, isn't that obvious? Because it, the the one who damaged, like Ruth here in our story, could pay with dead animals anyway. But anyway, they taught it because they wanted to teach you the second issue, which is pot novella. The depreciation is also on Naomi. And then we talked about who's the Torah, who has to bring the animal to court. And that we suggested was, a, the, that's in the end, we said it's possibly a machlok. Okay, we saw very clearly the opinion that the, that Ruth would have to bring it to court. And then we said, well, isn't that obvious that she would do it because it's in her best interest financially? But in the end, we said, right, even if it's not in her best interest financially, it doesn't make a difference. Still, the onus is on her. By the way, I'll just point out, bring it to court and taking it out of the pit are two different things, even though the Gemara seems to compare them as if they're one and the same. Okay, now we're moving on. Amr Shmuel. Ain Shamim. Okay, Shamim means we evaluate the value of whatever this item is, right? So now he says, Ain Shamim lo ganav lo ela lenuzaki. Let's say you stole my item and broke it. Then we don't do this whole thing of evaluating what it's worth now and you're going to pay only the deducted amount, right? You're going to deduct the amount of what it's worth now. No, if Ruth steals Naomi's animal and then the animal dies in Ruth's possession, Ruth has to return the full amount of the animal at the time of the theft to Naomi. Okay, whether she's a Ganav or a Gazlan, we'll get into all the differences between them later on in Sechet, Perit Haruba, um, later on in Baba Kama. What's the logic here? So there's two possible reasons to say this. Okay, so now they're saying, Ela Lenizakin. So this whole thing of Shamin is only in damages, not in theft. So damages are classic damages, right? And theft is I stole it or Ruth stole it and then damaged it. Okay, so now we're going to say the following. Why? Let's talk about two possible reasons why a thief is different. The first reason is, well, a thief is way worse than someone who damaged. A thief does, right? He, he did, he stole it, right? Or she stole it. Ruth steals something and then damages. That's, that's much worse, right? They shouldn't have stolen it. What was it doing? It wasn't like a showmare where I gave it to her to watch and she just didn't do a good job. Or it wasn't like, you know, we were walking on the street and she just happened to, you know, her, her ox gored my ox. But no, it's a case where she stole my animal and then damaged it. So that's already, um, you know, by the way, it's not even just damages. It could be she stole it and something happened to it. Okay. But it's way worse because she stole it and therefore we're penalizing that roof. And it's a penalty. It's just because she did something terrible. The second answer is what we've talked about before, which is, and it's very strange, but a, a thief becomes, and we're going to talk about this a lot more later in the Masechet, basically ends up being an owner of the item. And that's why when they have to pay it back, they basically become the new owner. So the shards or the carcass, all that becomes theirs. And therefore they have to pay the full amount at the time of the theft. Now you might say, what do you mean? You steal my item and you become the owner? But what it means is exactly this. You become the owner for loss of responsibility. It's, you are now the full owner. So when something happens to you, you have to return me the full amount. You don't tell me, oh, here, take your, your shards and you know you can sell them and I'll just pay you the difference. No, it's you've become the owner and therefore you pay me the full amount. And that's why also the pod is on you, the depreciation, because you stole it from me. I want to get it back the way it was at the moment it was stolen. So therefore, Shmuel says very simply, not for Ganav Gazlan, this whole law we just learned, only for Nisakin, only for damages. But then he adds, Va'aniyomel, af l'shoel. But I say it's also true for the Shoel, for one who borrows. Va'ava modeli, and Rav, Abba he uses his term for Rav, agrees with him. Now, there's a bit of a problem with what he says, because there were two things. We don't do Shuma for Ganav Gazlan, we do do it for damages. And I say even for the Shoel, even for someone who borrows. So they asked the question on what Shmuel said. Is this what you said? Even a shoel, we evaluate the item just like damages. Or maybe what he meant to say was, Or does he mean the shoel is like the thief? Okay, if I borrow an item and something happens to it, I'm like a thief basically. What would be the logic either way? Okay, well, to put it in the category of the Nizakin seems logical because he's a shomer just like everyone else and he's in the category. But then again, why would you have to single him out then? It seems a little strange. Singling him out would be to say, wait, the shoel is different. Now, why is a, a shoel is a borrower? A borrower in general, when it comes to laws of shomer, we're going to get to all the different laws and all the different who's responsible for what. A shoel is the most responsible. Why? Because of two things. Number one, they're borrowing something to use. Okay, whereas Usually a shomer is just watching something is not allowed to use it. They're borrowing it to use. Number two, they're not paying for its use like, let's say, a renter. A renter is borrowing something to use, but is paying you for it. They're not paying. They're getting all the benefits. They say, all the benefits are on the shomer. And therefore, they have a higher level of responsibility. And the Ramban even goes so far as to say that a shomer becomes like 
he bought something temporarily. It's like he owns the item right now. It's as if it's in my possession fully. Well, that would make sense to compare him to the Ganath because he basically becomes the owner of the object. And therefore, all these laws of Shuma, unless evaluated and deducted, are irrelevant because he becomes an owner. And that's to say he's like a Ganath. If you say the Ganav is only because they did something wrong, well, the Shomal didn't do anything wrong. They didn't, right? No. They did something wrong because something happened with the item in their possession. I borrowed your car and a terrible car crash happened and I happened to be in the middle of it. It wasn't my fault, right? I didn't do anything wrong. It's not like I stole your car and then got into a car accident. That would be much worse because I stole your car. What was I doing with your car? Shomal didn't do anything wrong. So you can see the logic of both directions. So now the Gemara is going to say, Tashma, let's learn from the following case. And they quote a case that happened. Who governed the Shal Narga I think a Narga is an axe or a pick or something like that, some sort of tool. He borrowed a tool from his friend, Tavra, and he broke it, okay, like the car. I took your car and I got into a car crash. Onto the Kameh de Rav. So they go before Rav. Amarle, Zil Shalem Le Narga Ma'alia. Go return him a perfectly good tool, you know, the same one you stole, which sounds like, right, the broken tool is irrelevant. Whatever the parts that are left are worth, we, we ignore right now. Right? It doesn't, it doesn't get deducted. So Shmamina and Shamin, it sounds like it's more like someone who stole something. To which they say, no, what are you talking about? That can't prove your point. It's going to prove the exact opposite because you obviously missed the end of the story. After Rav Paskin like that, Rav Kahn and Rav Asi came into, were maybe sitting in court and they said to him, is that really the law? What did you just do? To which, what was Rav's response? Vishati. Rav didn't respond. Now, the assumption here is he didn't respond because he thought they were right. And then, shmamina shamin, it sounds like we do deduct the amount. So, in the end, they seem to be concluding, and we're going to see that they passed in this way, the way Rav Asi and Rav Kahanis reacted to Rav, that really, Shoel is like the regular categories of damages, and it's not like a Ganav Islam, and you would deduct the amount of what the parts are left. Um, what, the, what those parts are left. Okay, eight. Now we're going to say, just in case you weren't confused enough with the different opinions here, again, we have it's clear ganav, we don't do any evaluation, they pay the full amount. It's clear for damages, they evaluate and they deduct. The machloka we saw was about the middle case, about the show. But now, Ula comes and says in the name of Rabbi Elazal, shamin le ganav le gazlan. Even a ganav and gazlan only pay the difference. And the original owner is left with whatever broken parts there are, a dead animal or whatever it might be. Rav Papi Amal ain't Shamin, but he disagrees. And Hilchata ain't Shamin lo and lo Gaslan. And Allah is, in fact, as we saw before, ignoring Ula in the name of Rabbi el which makes sense, by the way, because they were from Israel. And we're in Babylonia here. Aval is Shoal Shamin, Kid Rav Khan of Rav Asi. And the Psak is like Rav Khan and Rav Asi, that the Shoal is more like the one who damaged. Okay, so now we quoted, and this is going to be the lead into the rest of our daf, which has absolutely nothing to do with our topics. Ula here quoted Rabbi el and in fact, in the Yerushalmi, these came, we're now going to have five other cases where Ula quotes Rabbi Lazar on totally unrelated topics, and they're all brought here. Why are they brought here? So according to the Yerushalmi, the, these are all cases. Ula was one of those people who came from Israel to Babylonia, and he used to bring the Torah of Israel to Babylonia. He said lots of things in the name of Rabbi Lazar. Why these in particular? So that, according to the Yerushalmi, these were all cases that Rabbi Yehuda asked Ula, what does Rabbi Lazar have to say about this? And Ula answered. So that they were, it were cases that Rabbi Yehuda specifically wanted to know from Ula what Rabbi Lazar said. So the next case needs a little bit of a background. If a woman miscarries, and which we don't see any sort of fetus coming out, okay, and we're assuming this is after day 40, because the, the lot is already somewhat formed. Um, so there's an, but we do see a placenta type thing coming out of her body, okay? How they see this, you know. We're not going to get into all the gory details, but a placenta comes out of her body. Maybe she sees it, right? So she sees a placenta coming out. Now, the issue is a woman who miscarries has to keep as if there was a birth, okay? It's, it's um, now I'm not remembering if it's 40 days or even 80. I think it's after 40 days. So she has to keep, um, so, okay, you could say it's the amniotic sac, okay? She's, the amniotic, amniotic sac, com, sac comes out. The question is, can we assume that there was a fetus? Because we saw an amniotic sac, sac, so can we assume there was a fetus there? So the assumption is that ain vlad, ain shilia below vlad. There was definitely a fetus. That's the assumption. Okay, now, after day 40, what happens is this. We already have to assume that, now she's bleeding. Okay, now bleeding could be, you know, you anyway have to, there's all sorts of laws of purity and impurity if a woman is bleeding. But now we have to be concerned 
that, um, okay, I see people are writing different things. You could call it placenta, you could call it amniotic sac, you could, sac, you could call it, the, the, in the current, they use the word afterbirth, okay? It's something that usually comes after the baby comes out. So whatever we call this, we'll call it a shilia to make it simple. So a shilia, there's no such thing as a shilia without a vlad. That's an assumption the sugi is making, which is we assume that a vlad came out, that there was a fetus in there. Once there's a fetus, woman has to wait days of impurity. Okay, now the way it works for a woman who gives birth, okay, is that number one, you have seven days if it's a male, 14 days if it's a female. Now, obviously here, if there was no noticeable fetus, then you don't know if it was a boy or a girl. So you have to be strict and wait the 14 days and not the seven days. So she can only go to the mikvah after day 14. But another halacha is that in boys, there's the next, after the first seven days, the next 33 days until day 40 after the birth, if you bleed in those days, it's called Dom Tomer. We don't keep this anymore because of other issues, which we'll learn all about when we get to Nida. But those 40 days, those 33 days after, if she bleeds, she, like she went to the mikvah after day seven, this is a woman who knows she had a boy. She went to the mikvah after day seven, then she waits 33 days. Those 33 days, she actually is allowed to be with her husband. She can touch things. She doesn't make them impure. The only issue is she can't go to the temple yet, okay, and, and eat sacrificial meat, which at the end of her 40 days, she brings the korban yolendet, and then she can eat the sacrificial meat of the korban. That's her korban that she's supposed to bring. If it's a girl, it's 14 days, and then she has 66 days where it's called down Torah. Now, if you're not sure boy, girl, then it's tricky because you keep the first 14 as if they're dam tummy, but then you only keep till day 40 as dam tohar, because otherwise if she bleeds day 41, if it was a boy, it would be, a, it would be actually problematic blood that would normally make her tummy. If it's a girl, then it's dam tohar. So we have to be strict in both ways. So again, what would happen? 14 days of, of days of impurity, 16 days of dam tohar, and then until she can go to the temple, it's only after the 80 days are up. So that's, if you didn't get all the details, it's okay. But the point is this woman, we're going to say right now. So let's start with Amar Ula Amar Rabi Elazal. Shulia sheyat stam ktsata biyom rishon, and ktsata biyom shini. Okay, so now the question is where we start counting these 14 and, and, and additional 26 days and even the 80 days, because there's three issues, right? When she ends the dam tame, which days are going to be tahor days, and when is she going to be able to go to the temple? Okay, so now, in this case, the problem is, now, Again, one more thing you have to know. A shilia comes out, we assume there was a vlad. And we can even be concerned that maybe the vlad, did, and it's one option is the vlad came out and we just didn't see it, the fetus. The other option is that the fetus dissolved into this shilia. And then the question is, now there's a law that once, the, and it's, when do we determine it? Let's say it takes course over a, a few days when the majority of the fetus comes out. Well, if the, this shilia came out over a course of two days, we don't know when the majority of the body of the, the of this uh, fetus came out. So again, it's a little gross this whole thing to think about, but let's just deal with it. So, So part comes out the first day, part comes out the second day. You know, part comes out let's say on Sunday, part comes out on Monday. You start counting from day one. We assume, in other words, again, assumption number one: there must have been a vlad in the shulia, or it was indicated that there was a vlad that came out. And then number two: we assume the majority came out on day one. To which I'm really Rava, Madatech the Chumra, what you're saying, we have to be Machmir that maybe it all came out on day one. But Chumra da Atin de Kulahu. But that's a Chumra that's going to lead to a Kula. Why? Because if you start on day one, then you're going to end a day early. And then your Dam Tohar is going to start a day earlier, which is, is blood. You're going to say, well, maybe if, you, if it really came out, and we don't know when the, when the majority of the body came out. Maybe the majority of the body came out on day two. So while you're being Machmir in one sense, the world is calling you Tameh. You're being lenient because your day is going to end a day early, you're counting. So what does Rav himself say? Um, right, and then he explains why the Kamatara Lemi Rishon, because you're going to start the Dam Tower 14 days from the first day, not 14 days from the second day. So, So no. what I mean is you have to be concerned that the first day she's Tameh, but you're really only going to count your count from the second day. And that way you, you make sure to cover all your bases. So now they say, okay, well, Michael Masha, what are you trying to teach us? There's no such thing that part of a shiliyah comes out and there's no vlad in it. If you want to teach us that, well, we learn that somewhere else. Okay, now, why? why? Why is this the assumption of what they're teaching? Because if it's possible that some of a shiliyah could come out without there being a vlad, then you would have two spikot here. When there's two doubts, then we actually will lean in it. Number one, we would say, did the vlad, was it in this part of the shiliyah or was it not? And number two, even if we assume it did, 
did the majority come out or not? Because it's only once the majority comes out. So that would be two spake code, and then we'd be lenient. And that's not what we're doing here. So it must be because you assume for sure a Vlad, if a Shiliyah comes out, there must have been a Vlad with it. If that's what you're saying, well, to aim at South Shiliyah, but Vlad, there's no such thing as part of the Shiliyah coming out without there being a Vlad in there at all. And then it only becomes one something. Did the majority come out or did it not? Well, and then we'd be strict. Tanina, we already learned that in a case about an animal. Now we're going to talk about a different topic, which is an animal that you slaughter. You slaughter a female animal who's pregnant. And there's a there's a fetus, a fully grown animal inside. Well, or, or even less than a fully grown animal. You don't need to slaughter that animal. You can eat that animal without slaughtering. It's called a ben pikua. But if the animal put its head out or the majority of its body out and was like about to be born and then went back in, once the majority comes out, it can no longer be covered by the shechita of the mother. And then it needs a separate shechita if, you know, it's worthy of eating. So shiliyah So now they say, if there was this shiliyah that comes out of the animal, it's the part of it comes out, it's forbidden to eat. Siman v'lab isha, siman v'lab behemah. And then they say it's the same thing, right? Now, even if it doesn't have a, even if you don't see a v'lan in there, it's forbidden because again, if it came out and let's say went back into the body of the animal, it's as if it came out before the slaughtering and therefore you can't eat it without slaughtering it, okay? Or, you know, in this case, it, it's not covered by the shrita of the mother. And then you wouldn't really be able to eat it because it's like something that came from a non-kosher animal that wasn't slaughtered, okay? It would be a part of the animal that wasn't part of, covered with the slaughter of the mother. That's because a shiliyah that comes out, we assume there's a vlad inside. And therefore, right, if it wasn't a vlad, it wouldn't really matter. But because there was a vlad inside, and then we have to be concerned that maybe the majority came out already, then you can't eat it. So now they say, isn't that the same thing? To which they answer, Imi Manit, if you want to learn from there, moving out on a bed, to yesh mitzat shliyah belavlad, it could be that you could say the following. Maybe there is mikzat shliyah belavlad. You could have this, whatever we want to call it, afterbirth or shliyah that comes out without a vlad in it. But, gzera mikzata to kula kamash malan. We wanted to say that if a little bit comes out, we're going to forbid it, not because we necessarily think that there is something there, but because if we allow it, if it came out a little bit, if it came out, then you might think that if the whole thing comes out, it's okay as well. And that for sure is not because the whole thing for sure has a vlad in it. But the question is, what about mikzad? And that's why we're not sure if part of a vlad, part of a shaliyah might not have a vlad in it. Well, that's why you needed Ula to tell you, no, no, no. Every mikzad shaliyah has a vlad in it. And don't think that this is forbidden, this case of the Mishnah, because it's just exera. No, it's actually forbidden because we hold that there is no such thing. Every part, a little bit of the shaliyah comes out, we have to assume there's a vlad in there definitively and not maybe there is, or maybe we have to be strict or something. Okay, that was the first halacha. The other ones are a little bit simpler. Amar ula amar rabi elazar. Bechor shenitraf b'yom shloshim yom. Okay, maybe they're a little graphic as well. This isn't so pleasant topics. Miscarriage, child being attacked by animals. But we have a little baby who's a firstborn. And within the first 30 days, he gets attacked by an animal and eaten. Some people say they don't get to choose that case because it was very common that animals would attack little babies. I don't know if that's true or not. But in any case, they bring this case now. We'll see in a minute why specifically in trough, but it could have been something else. Some people actually think it means something else entirely. Trust has a different explanation, but we're going to go with the Rashi. Ein pudimoto. Now, you're supposed to redeem a firstborn son on the 30th day, right? Or after. Now, why 30 days? Because they weren't sure if the fetus was, if the baby was going to be viable until they lived for 30 days. That was their sense in those days. You have to wait the first 30 days, only then the, the, is it viable. I mean, also because the Torah says it, but the assumption is the Torah says it because it's viable. So once it gets to day 30, you're obligated to pay Ben. Now, the question is, what happens if we never knew if the child was viable or not because it was attacked by an animal? It got killed for some other reason, not because it didn't, it didn't live, because it couldn't survive, but because it, it was attacked. Now, Maybe, it, it, and it's, why 30 days? It's 30 days because we weren't sure if it was viable. So it could be the father is obligated to do the pidyon even after the death of the baby. Because theoretically, right, it was likely this child was going to live had it not been attacked by the animal. Of course, you don't really know. And that's why in the end, since we don't have proof that the animal was, that the child was going to be viable or not, therefore you don't actually do the pidyon. The Chaim Tanarami Barhama, he also brings it from a bride to the same halacha that, uh, that uh, Ula brought in the name of Rabbi Elazar. Because it says, which sounds like in any case, usually when something's double, we say in any case, you might have thought even an, a, a kid that's attacked, you know, a baby before day 30, it says, which means, but meaning there's some sort of, meaning not every case. Okay. So this case where 
It might have been likely it would make it to day 30, but he didn't for some other reason. Well, still, you don't do pity. This is something we saw in A large animal is acquired by pulling the animal. To which the says, what are you talking about? How could you say that? It says in the Mishnah, remember, you just have to, because it's hard to pull a big animal, and they might pull the other way. So the way you transfer authority, um, ownership is by giving the reins to the other person. And once they have the reins in their hands, that's enough. So they say, so how could Rabbi Elazar say something against the Mishnah? Well, very simply, Hud Amar Ki Aitana, Titani holds by the following bright, and we saw this also in Kedushin, Chafamim Oblim Zov Zov Mishicha, Big animals and small animals are actually done by pulling, even though it might be hard to do. The rabbis say in the bright, yes, it's by pulling. And Rabbi Shimon wears over the Bahad Baha by lifting. Remember, we talked about the, the, the elephant, right? How you lift it. Anyway, also by lifting, which is much more hard to imagine. But anyway, the point being that Rabbi Elazar holds like the rabbis in that bright time, even though it goes against the mission. Next halacha. Brothers come to court, they want to split the inheritance of their father. But in the meantime, before they got to court, they took money from the inheritance and they bought clothes with it because they needed clothes to wear. So they bought clothes with it. Well, we deduct the amount of the clothing they're wearing. And the assumption is that what they're wearing is what they bought, okay? That they didn't have like 50 different outfits, but they had one shirt that they basically wore. And we deduct that amount if they took it from the inheritance. So if you spend $50 on a shirt, we're going to deduct that from your portion. If you spend 30, deduct but not what the children are wearing. It's very interesting. And some people say also not the wives. Why? Because the assumption is we don't want to bring them to court to have to, it's embarrassing to bring the kids to court to show their clothes that they're wearing. In fact, the Yerushalmi says the Big Day Shabbat they would bring. Why? Because the Big Day Shabbat weren't on them on the day they went to court because they went to court during the week. So they had two sets of clothes. One was Shabbat clothes. One was everyday clothes. Everyday clothes they were wearing. We're not going to shut them to court. It's, it's humiliating for them to stand in front of court with their clothes and everyone about you. But the ones that you know we could bring, we could bring. There are some cases that will, even the ones they're wearing, we won't. For example, like for example, the older brother, he might have a fancy suit. Why is that? All the brothers agreed to let him have this fancy suit because he's the one who's dealing with all their father's property and he needs to look presentable in court, let's say he goes. So that might be an expense that all the brothers equally share and therefore we're not going to deduct that. It's a funny kind of thing. It actually comes up in other suggests about how, you know, there's a certain amount of clothing, like a wardrobe, uh, budget that you know the person in charge gets because we want them to look presentable in court. Ruth gives Naomi something to watch, and Naomi decides she doesn't really want to watch it. She gives it to Yael without consulting with Ruth. And then while it's with Yael, something happens to it. So if she passed it on to Yael, she's exempt, Naomi, even though Ruth gave her the responsibility. The loma by If Ruth getting if uh, Naomi wasn't getting paid by Ruth, but Naomi paid Yael to do it, and Yael is kind of taking more responsibility, because she's doing a better kind of Shmirah. Not even that case, but even if Naomi was getting paid and she passed it on to Yael and didn't pay her for it, still she's exempt. Even though she lowered the level of Shmirah, still she's going to be Pator. And this goes back to the case of if you pass it to someone who's not capable of watching, you're responsible. But if you pass it to someone who's capable of watching it, we assume they're going to do a good job. And if something happens, it's their fault, not yours. As the middle person. But Rav Amal, he disagrees. And he goes in the reverse. He says, not only is Naomi for sure responsible, but not even if she lowered the Shemira, but even if she was a Shemir Chinam and she gave it to a Shemir Sachar, she gave it to someone who was actually, she's paying her for it, she's still chayab, to Amrle, because Ruth could say to Naomi, At mehem li b'shvua, hai lo mehem li b'shvua. I give it to you because I believed you. Now what happens? If something happens, let's say it gets stolen from Naomi's house, she'll take an oath and swear that it was stolen and then she gets exempt because as long as she takes an oath about it, she's believed and she's not liable if it's stolen, for example. So let's say she's a shomer chinam anyway. Okay, I'm not going to get into all the details. But Ruth could say, I don't trust this Yael. I don't know. Maybe she lies in court. I, I don't have any anything to do with her. Abai actually offers a different explanation, which comes up somewhere else, which is Ruth could say, I, I don't want my item someone else watching, and I trusted you. I don't trust her. So it's either trusting to watch it, according to Abai, according to Rabbi, it's trusting to take an oath. So that's a machloket between Ula, according to Rabbi Lazar, and what Rabbi says. Last one for today. You can take money from a loan. Instead of taking my land, you can also take my slaves. 
Did he say even from the atonement? Because remember, what do we learn about orphans? If the father owed money, they can only take it from land that the father had at the time that he died. So can you also take it from slaves? Right? Is, that, is that considered like land? Now, there's all this debate, oh, is a slave like land or are they like movable property? They're kind of in the middle and that's what the city is dealing with. So they say lo, mine. No, no, no. We're talking about from the original owner and then the guy who took the loan out, not if he gave it to his orphans. Orphans, you can only take land, not slaves. We're talking about Canaanite slaves that were part of the owned by the person. To which they say, what do you, then, then what's the Kiddush of what Rabbi Lazar says? It's even, if it's from the person who took the loan, you can take any metal to them from him. If you let me money and I don't pay back, you can kind of take the cloak off my, my back as payment for your loan. So of course you can take my slaves. So what's the Kiddush? To which they answer, and we'll stop here for now, but it's if I made the slave and I said, I'm borrowing money from you. You're going to collect it from this slave. And then I sold it to somebody else. Okay? That's the chidush here. That it's like land to that extent. That it could be leaned if I specifically said you're going to collect it from the slave. As Rabbi said, I said, you're going to collect it from the slave. And then I sold my slave. You can collect it from that slave. But if I did it with my sure, and then I sold it, and what's the reason? My time Because everyone will know that the ever was an apotiki, but they won't know about the shore. And therefore, when they went to buy it, the buyer had no idea. But with the evid, he should have known. It would have been known, and therefore he knew, and therefore you could collect it from the evid. And that's right now the way we're going to assume this means. Tomorrow, we're going to see them understand it in a different way. So what we did today, we're talking about the nevela in the beginning part, and then we move to these other statements of Ula in the name of Rabbi Elazar, all sorts of different statements.